In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was a kid, I used to go fishing with my dad. There's a really great picture of me and him together when I'm about four or so. And it's one of those slate gray fall days in Michigan. And we're next to this pond that's kind of like a man-made thing that's stocked with carp. And I'm there all bubbled up because it's cold and holding a bamboo fishing pole, looking so happy and excited to be there fishing. As I got older, each summer we would rent a house in northern Michigan next to a lake, always, because my dad wanted to fish. And there's something about waking up early in the morning, 5 o'clock, 5.30, and heading out into a pristine summer morning. There's really nothing to replace it. If it was sunny, the lake would be crystal clear and perfectly still. You could see the trees of the forest around it reflected, looking doubly large. Once we got into the little 14-foot boat with an outboard motor, we would pierce the silence of the morning and glide through the mist that was rising up from the water. So much time spent in a boat with another person brings you closer together. And oftentimes, my father and I would talk in ways that we never would if we were doing something else together. I learned a lot about him simply by sitting there in that boat. I learned that fishing was one of the few things that his father did with him. It was a sort of distant relationship, one marked by a lot of anger and frustration on both sides. But somehow, being together in that boat, they were able to enjoy one another's company. I am not a very good fisherman. Every once in a while, I'd catch a bluegill or a sunfish and be happy about that. We would put it in the little bucket of fish that we would carry through the rest of the fishing day. And eventually, we would come back in and scale the fish, fillet them, and leave it for someone else to cook, unfortunately. But I will never, ever forget those mornings spent with my father on that fishing boat. He's been gone for almost five years now. But those memories live inside of me. They feed me day by day, even when I'm not even aware of them. That's how powerful an experience this was. Last week, our guest preacher, Hugh Haley, challenged us to discover a childhood innocence inside of us. She said that the only way that we as a society will be able to mend our differences is by returning to that part of ourselves that is small and full of wonder, but also vulnerable. So I'm going to ask you, what did it feel like to hear me telling that story about when I was small and full of wonder and vulnerable? Does it inspire you maybe to tell stories from your own childhood or any other time in your life to people in your family who maybe haven't heard them before, to friends over a Zoom call or FaceTime, maybe even to a stranger in a moment of common humanity? Well, telling stories is a central part of being a Christian. This morning, we just heard a story, a story from the Gospel of Mark. It's a story about Jesus approaching fishermen, simple people who spent a lot of time out of those boats on the Sea of Galilee. They would gather their catch and bring them back to shore. But on this particular day, Jesus approached them and asked them to drop everything they were doing and follow him. It's a crazy proposition, and also a really good story, which is one of the reasons we still tell it now, 2,000 years after it happened. So just like that story of me fishing with my dad, it still lives on inside of us, through us. It lives on through the 
very act of telling these stories. Now, if there's something about this story that maybe rubs you slightly the wrong way, I get it. Oftentimes, the story of the calling of Simon Peter and Andrew is seen as a template for what we call evangelism, or the way that we reach out to other people as a church in an attempt to bring them into the beloved community. There's a certain model of evangelism that I'm sure many of us have experienced ourselves, and it's based on the notion that there are fishermen who have been called by Jesus to haul in a catch, to bring them into the church. In this model, you and I are supposed to go out and be those fishermen by hook or crook and get people into the church. But that's not a very nice thing, is it now? I mean, I'm not just floating through a stream trying to get caught on a hook by a worm. It's not a very nice feeling. It's kind of condescending and degrading, actually. This type of evangelism involves other types of stories. Stories that are scary. Stories that tell me that I am less than. Stories that tell me about things like hell, punishment. I've been subject to those kind of stories many times. It's kind of a funny thing. I can't tell you the number of times I've stood on the steps of this very church, dressed like this or like Father Spencer, and had people approach me about becoming a Christian. It's kind of a weird situation. And each time that happens, I'm sort of sorry for the person. What I want to tell them is that you think you're a fisherman, but really, you're just a fish, just like me. There is a very prominent theologian from the early church named Tertullian. Tertullian was born in Africa in about the year 160 AD, and he came up with many of the theological concepts that we still use in our church today. He wrote a famous treatise on baptism. And this is what he had to say about baptism. He said, But we little fishes, after the example of our great fish, Jesus Christ, are born in water, nor have we safety in any other way than by permanently abiding in water. We little fishes, we little fishes follow the example of our great fish, Jesus Christ. And here Tertullian is referencing something you've probably seen on bumper stickers in the 1990s or 2000s. It was very popular. We see that little fish sort of symbol, and then in the middle there are the letters Jesus, or sometimes in Greek. It goes back to an ancient thing where Christians who were persecuted would communicate with one another through symbols so that the authorities couldn't understand what was going on. The word for fish in Greek is, uh, is a sort of abbreviation for Jesus Christ. But the point remains, we are little fishes. And Jesus is a big fish. So in this story, when Jesus is calling the disciples to go out and become fisher people of people, he's really telling us that at any given time, we are both the fishermen and the fish. And isn't that what the life of faith is really like? We are just all little fishes swimming in this vast ocean of time and space and spirit. We long to swim together, not as lone sharks, but in a school where we can feel that we have belonging, where we know that we're going in the right direction. Right now, it feels like we are swimming against the current, that we've hit a turbulent patch of human history. And it's true. But when you think that we are all just little fishes, following the example of our great fish, Jesus, well, then you can see that we're not the only ones in the ocean. We have each other, and we know that there are people who have gone before us, and generations to come that will also face challenges, just like we do today. And we're all swimming towards that goal, 
for it's the kingdom of heaven that our great fish proclaims, then we do have meaning and direction in our lives. That to me is what evangelism means. It means that we little fishes have a responsibility to the other little fishes of the world to show them the things that we have come to know, not out of a place of condescension or even we know more than other people, but simply because, well, that's what fishes want from one another. And that's what we do. And that's where our great fish is leading us. In a time of crisis, we're all just sort of trying to get by from one day to another. It's impossible to tell stories like this. It's impossible to think of ourselves as little fishes full of wonder, vulnerable in a vast ocean. And it seems like the past many years, each day has presented itself with a new crisis, a new thing to be nervous or scared about, a new source of anxiety. The temperature of the ocean is literally rising. And when that's happening, it's impossible for us to tell our stories. I don't know about you, but for me, it seems like things are getting just a little bit lighter. Like the temperature of the ocean might actually turn down just a little bit. And as we are left to survey the damage and destruction that has been done in our society and the crisis that we are still living under, we are going to need to be little fishes. We are going to need to put our trust in the God who brought us together and made us a vast, gigantic school to begin with. We are going to need to lead with some wonder and some vulnerability. And there's really no better way to do this than to tell a story. You can't tell a story if you're cowering in fear. But you can if you lead with courage. Our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, has challenged all of Episcopalians and all Americans to schedule a time to speak with someone that they disagree with. Not about politics or their way of seeing the world, but simply to be together, to learn about each other, to tell our stories and to listen to the stories of others. On Wednesday, President Biden, in his inauguration speech, challenged us to try to spend a little bit of time in each other's shoes. Now, I don't take this to mean that we have to accept acts of violence or some of the things that are truly tearing our society apart. Rather, I hear it as a call to exchange stories. A call to kind of let our guards down just a little bit to show ourselves as the little fishes that we truly are. I would say that All Saints Church, at least for me, is one of those wonderful examples of little fish evangelism. Our community, it's amazing to say, continues to grow and expand, even as we are physically separated. And that's not because we have all gone out as members of the church and become fishers of men in the sense of throwing out a net and seeing what strange sea creature will drag up from the deep. No. We've led by being little fishes, by showing ourselves to each other, by offering everyone the space in this beloved community is bound together in love. In the season that is to come, we are going to engage in a process of story sharing. In Lent, here at All Saints Church, we will form story sharing groups, small groups, where people will exchange stories just like I do, about my story with my father. We'll get to know people in deeper ways. And we're also going to exchange stories about our experience of race in America and in society. This is going to be our effort, one of our ways to help reach the divides in our community, in our society, and in our church, to heal some of the wounds of racism. 
And we don't expect to solve every problem, not even in our parish. But we do trust that as little fishes, we will follow the example of our great fish, Jesus. That we will call one another out into a deeper level of being. And that following him and trusting in his example, we will be able to show a little bit more of ourselves for the sake of God's kingdom. Now, Lent is still a few weeks away. So I invite you to think um, whether you feel called to participate in a story sharing group. But I can guarantee you that it feels really good to tell your stories. It feels even better to hear the precious stories given to you by your fellow members of your church. Everyone's invited. Anyone who has any affiliation with All Saints, whether you've been here for a long time, or you simply know someone who has been here before, whether you found us online or you attend in person. We are hoping to try to mend some of the breaches that have come up over the past many years and even centuries. We are hoping to become fishers of people by ourselves being little fish. Friends, this is what a loving community looks like. There is a way that is different than the forces of fear that have been dominating our society and our public life. That way is the kingdom of God, the very kingdom that Jesus, our great fish, proclaims. So let us follow him. Let us follow him into adventures that we as little fishes cannot even imagine right now. Let us follow him with our little tails and our little fins, making ourselves full of wonder and vulnerability, all for the sake of God's love.